Hey, there we go. Okay, I see it. All right, thank you, Steve, our wonderful producer. <laughs> and hello again, Dee, you have camera this time. I'm very excited. I do. <laughs> I like your, your floral sort of quasi Hawaiian shirt pattern going on. I know, right? It's, it's, it's like one of my favorite shirts and it's so comfy. We have um, our tabaxi in the Saturday group that we stream on Twitch. Uh, has like a whole collection of those and her fiance hates them. <laughs> <laughs> so, but we're always egging her on to wear the Hawaiian shirts. It's like a whole thing. I mean, they're comfortable. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love them. Uh, I need I need to get one myself. Uh, okay, so we're back to talk about Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft. We talked about Candlekeep Mysteries last time and I am very excited. <laughs> we, Dee and I went through it over the weekend and wow. There is just so much, so much going on here, so much happening between the new Gothic lineages, the magic items, the really cool and terribly terrifying creepy <laughs> monsters. Yes. As well as the new subclasses uh, for Warlock and Bard as far as the College of Spirits, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. So where do you want to start? We can start anywhere. Oh man, where to start? Right. This this is just a giant. I think I said it a couple times while we were uh, talking about it over the weekend. It just feels like a giant love letter to everything gothic, everything that just kind of like tickles your fancy for you know Halloween esque uh, everything really. So yeah, that, I guess we can start with a map if nothing else. Yeah, and that ties back into the adventure module that is included. Uh, within Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft, which is incredible. It's so incredible that I put it as a subscriber milestone, a subscriber yes. and a follower <laughs> milestone for both our Twitch and YouTube channels to run one off stream and then another one on stream because it is, it's incredible. It's, it's basically like Hill House. It reminds me a lot of Hill House, which is I think mm -hmm. what we talked about over the weekend. But yes. I know, I know there's like three different versions of Hill House. I'm thinking yeah. of the Netflix show when I, oh. when I say that, but apparently there's, do you, have you seen the other ones that everyone always talks about? Um, I, I've kind of seen them around. What I'm thinking of though, is like the, the board game. Um, the, uh, I was like butcher this, this name cause it's so long, but it's like, it's a haunted house, uh, on the hill. And it's, it, this was giving me like major vibes of that because, you know, just with like the haunts and, yeah, you know, not to not to go too much into it, but like it's it's just mm, so good, so just good. Kiss. <laughs> just, just kiss. Just ah. So, the House of Lament is actually in Borka, which is one of the domains of dread. A little sidebar on the domains of dread: they're all here. There's I have only heard of a couple of these mm -hmm. from Jordan Ph is silent on YouTube, um, <laughs> one of my favorite lore tubers. And again, only having heard of some of these in passing, it's just so cool that they have all of these amazing, incredible full color maps. And anyone that knows me or that heard the last podcast that we did knows that I hate black and white maps, <laughs> especially for overlay maps. Yes. I'm a big fan of color. Though the House of Lament is black and white, but I'm really intrigued about that board game. If you figure out what that is, exactly the name of it, send that to me because I want to yeah. play that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, not not to you know like toot its own horn, but it is one of the best games I've ever played. And I mean, you know, it, it's something that's on Tabletop Simulator. Um, oh, okay. So if you ever you know have some friends, just definitely definitely uh, get into playing it. Okay, we'll probably put it in the do what they do with the description down below. Yeah. So speaking of not necessarily board games, but we have a seance screen as part of the actual module. So in the module itself, in the Manor House Haunting module, you can actually do one of several seances throughout the campaign, which is really cool because they give you a freaking Ouija board, which is awesome. <laughs> and you get to move it around and the, there's a lot of DM tips and tools, obviously how to run that properly, but you communicate with so, uh, one of several different entities within the house. And it is just very much, like you said, a love letter to things like Hill House or the board game that you were describing. Yeah. And it's really, really incredible. And me as as a practitioner right, of the spiritual and pagan arts, this is just really, um, really just incredible for me personally mm -hmm. on that personal level. It's just nice to see it in the game. Right. But over here, here's the house. So what are you going to say? 
Oh, no, I was just going to say, no, 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 you're good. Um, I actually just found it. I uh, was typing off to the side. Uh, it is called Betrayal at the House on the Hill. Uh, okay. If you've ever heard of that game, uh, like I said, that that's that's kind of the, the game that I was referencing when we were talking about it on uh, over the weekend. Major, major vibes of this game. It's always about the house on the hill. <laughs> <laughs> Something about the house on the hill. You know, they're just they're just so spooky. So the house of the Met. I'm really excited about this, right? So this in and of itself, which is really surprising, considering that when we talked about Candle Keep, there were, I think our general consensus was that some or a lot of the adventures were just a little bit lackluster. Mm -hmm. This one adventure is just, wow. <laughs> There's yes. so, yeah. What were your initial thoughts on the adventure itself? I mean, because for me, I'm just going to gush about it and just say how incredible <laughs> it is. So what's your like um, general take on it? just this one standalone adventure? It, I mean, the, the general feel I got from this was just kind of, wow. This is because I think it says somewhere in, in the flavor text that it's supposed to be for levels. Uh, like, it'll take the characters from level one to three. And I was like this is a lot of stuff for one to three. Like this feels like it could be easily one to five or like maybe even beyond uh, just because there's so much material here. And then of course, you, you know, you have the beautiful map. So it's like you realistically could have more adventures outside of just, uh, you know, what is given right here with the, the Lament House. It's just, there's so much in here. And here's the flow chart, which I really like because it doesn't really give away too many spoilers, if any at all. It's yeah. just the flow chart of, and this is again, one to three, as Dee said, and it's the arrival, uh, exploration, uh, the first seance, as my voice cracks <laughs> deeper into the house. That's how I'm, I'm, the content is already scaring me so that my voice is cracking. <laughs> Second seance, mysteries of the house, final seance, and uh, the finale towards the end there. But there is, just so much going on here between using the seances, between the hauntings, which are really cool, and the hauntings you can bring into other adventures, which is, I think, the best part of the hauntings. Yeah. And look at this amazing art. This is just so pretty. This is one of the examples of the ghost. It's so, like, it's just so good. These hauntings are so amazing. I think, like, not only the hauntings, but then, you know, I'm sure we'll get to it later, but the traps were probably one of my favorite things. And I told, I told you, I hate traps. I hate how traps are implemented in normal D and D, but these were so involved, and I loved how like you can just you can mess with them. Uh, how you solve them isn't just the oh I roll a dice, uh, thieves tool plus proficiency. It's like it's not it's not just that. It's yeah. So here it is. Here are the here are the haunted traps. So again, there may be a few spoilers here and there. I think we're going to try to avoid spoilers, but we're going to talk about the mechanics of it just because you can use them in other campaigns. If you're a DM and if you're a player, you can get excited about these uh, types of traps. But just in the, by the very nature of discussing some of this stuff, there is going to be maybe a few minor spoilers, if not very, very minor. But the traps, as you just said, it's not these tools. <laughs> It's things like, I'm looking at it right now, I put it up on the screen, channel divinity, remove curse, things like that, dispel evil and good. Uh, different, you know, thinking outside the box. And there's a hundred different right. ways, you know, that you can disarm one of many traps. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, maybe there's a spoiler for that first time, but who is going to use a thieves tools on a hot, uh, you know, thieves tools on a haunted mirror. Right, right. I want to give people the benefit of the doubt and, <laughs> you know, and say that they would probably be, it would be thinking outside the box, but there's a few yeah. here and I don't want to go into too many spoilers, but they're just reading the names. There's the dance macabre, the faceless malice, the icon of the lower aerial kingdoms, which is the one that I think you said was just pure evil. Yes. <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> there's one that I think just makes your face blank and distorted. Uh, and there is another one that it just triggers a couple of more intense hauntings. Mm -hmm. What was your, um, do you, do you remember a favorite off the top of your head? The only one that, that sticks in my <laughs> mind personally is looking into the mirror and then turning around and your face is just gone and everybody gone, sees yeah. your face is gone. And everyone's like, um, ah! <laughs> I don't know. Um, like me as both a DM and a player, I think the, the even though I said it was very, very evil, uh, the icon one was just so 
visceral and so involved. I mean, like there's there's ways to definitely get out of it, um, but I like how complex this one gets. Um, so I'm kind of on the fence with this one and Dance Macabre because I just, it's so very amusing to me that the it would just, I mean, I'm not gonna spoil it, but what the trap makes you do is probably my favorite thing ever. You can say it. Because it's funny to me. Okay. You can um, say it. It makes you dance. Like it literally summons a spectral fam- phantom of the opera dude and it just makes you dance. Beetlejuice. It, that's hilarious to me. It's it yes, it's exactly. I think we said that. It's, it's the it's the dining scene from Beetlejuice. That is in here. And <laughs> there is no way that that is not a love letter to the Beetlejuice movie. Which exactly. I think, is, I think is the original. That's the original mm. Beetlejuice movie, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. I don't know how old the that fandom is there, but with, I think <laughs> with me, correct us if we're wrong. <laughs> yes, I, I think with me also being so into anime, I, I always, I, I'm always of the mindset that there, oh uh, uh, yeah, the mindset. <laughs> I'm always <laughs> of the mindset that there was something that came before, just because most, if not all, the anime that we watch, even the video games, are based mm-hmm. off of something from like 20 years ago. Right. So right. that that line of thinking is like spilling over into sort of more Americanized. Mm-hmm gothic horror or Americanized comic horror like Beetlejuice. Right. And it, it makes me second guess myself and say things like, was there like an original Beetlejuice manga? <laughs> you know, or something yeah, like I that. mean, as far as I know, that, at least in my a experience, comic. that was my first, you know, experience with uh, with Beetlejuice. So it, it's entirely possible because I know that it, yeah. it's still going strong with like, you know, what you were saying, like with the comics, uh, things of that nature. Does Beetlejuice have a comic? Uh, I've seen, it's either a comic or it's a, um, a cartoon, but I know I've seen like stylized versions well, they, of, of them. They had the animated show in yes. the 90s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure someone made a Beetlejuice comic at some point. Oh, yeah. There's no way someone didn't. I'm actually curious. The sandworms are great, by the way. Oh, no, they are. <laughs> so let's talk about these hauntings. I have them up on the screen. Uh, yeah, but... <laughs> I am just all types of Freudian <laughs> slips tonight. That was actually unintentional. I have them up on the screen. Actually, I was watching Davy Chappie's video before we hopped into the stream today mm-hmm. on Van Richten's. And I just want to share a Davy Chappie joke with you because it was incredible. Sure. Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft with your Dampier lineage. You can really have a positive experience. <laughs> Oh, man. You know, <laughs> Debbie never, never ceases to, to, to please in all of his ridiculousness. Um, I, I do definitely enjoy some of his videos. I'm pointing off in that direction because I didn't come up with that. <laughs> Believe it or not, that was not me. Usually I, I love puns, but most of the time I'm grabbing them from elsewhere. <laughs> but hauntings, we... I. I can't remember exactly what your thoughts were. I mean, for me mm. personally, again, as being involved in a sort of uh, an actual practitioner and um, sort of spiritual witchcraft and uh, that type of thing, mm. this, you know, getting involved, seeing hauntings and seeing them done well in a game and that type of connection to the spiritual realm is really uh, intense for me, which I think is really cool. But the hauntings are almost perfect. Mm. Were there any that stood out to you? Um. I think um, just re- I'm just rereading them because um, I know there was one that we had talked about where the ghost kind of just like came, they came through and they were just doing their own thing, using the room as if it was uh, real life. Um, oh, the one that did st- yeah, the one that did stand out to me though was the um, leaving brief messages or, or talking to yeah. the players. Um, because I thought that that would be a very cool way, especially if you have um, certain subclasses of characters, like let's say you have, you know, like the new the new warlock, the undead warlock, or even the phantom rogue. I thought that would be like a really cool way of like tying in some of those flavor mechanics um, into these types of haunting. So, you know, it's not just the, the, the spirits that kind of haunt them, but now how does that interact with the spirits that are in this particular, uh, house? And how does that interact with, you know, the spirits that, as I said, are haunting them? Or, right. you know, are, is there some sort of crossover? And I think what really 
stands out to me when I think of that is like the blood on the mirror. Mm -hmm. And yeah, of course, there's always, what's cool about this is that there's always room for interaction between the different spirits and players and integrating backstories and getting everyone involved in that sort of thing, which is really awesome. Yeah, I, I definitely agree on that, on that part. There's one here where the spirit just walks through a character or a wall. Uh, here is your <laughs> leaving a brief message or a threat or a question, anything like that. <laughs> Yeah, because I mean, that's definitely going to freak your player out of like, you know, you just casually, um, you know, every once in a while, hey, make a perception check or hey, what's your passive perception? Just messing with them like that. Or maybe not even just saying that, like you're you're just telling them, hey, you, you, you two in particular, not, not everyone in the party, but you two in particular, you guys hear something and, you know, just making it so that it, it's very involved. Yeah, and I think. Another one here that I really like is the spirit recreates a terrifying moment, either its own death or someone else's visceral ends. You're just walking through a hallway and you see a projected image of a mm -hmm. ghost just murdering each other. Right. In the most horrific way possible. There's a couple of different ways that tie into some spoiler elements of the story that we mm -hmm. won't get into, but it's just the actual lore behind House of Lament is just, whoa. Uh, Phenomenal. Just, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think we can probably go over some of the background lore. It was about a uh, a bandit, uh, a bandit warlord, and his castle. The house of the men used to be a castle, and there was a local warrior who desperately wanted to depose him. She lost the battle, but in her moment of defeat, snatched it after receiving a prophecy, snatched victory from the jaws of defeat, and turned the evil on itself, and really just went full on horror macabre, entombed the bandits and the bandit leader within the walls of the castle as mortar. Very, uh, spoiler for Attack on Titan. <laughs> <laughs> Shoot, I wasn't even going to say it sounds like, uh, you know, the, with us describing it that way, it sounds like the cask of a, uh, the cask, the, uh, yes, yes. The cask could be a Montalado. Thank you. Cause Am um, I saying it right? <laughs> Montiago, something like that. You know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> I think it's a Montalado, but we, we actually read that in so we had, I went to Catholic school uh, mm. for grades one through eight, but we had a really progressive, very liberal, even for the mid nineties, oh. late nineties teacher who was sixth, seventh and eighth grade, but mm -hmm. for homeroom, she was eighth grade. It was a weird system in Catholic school. And mm -hmm. we did Shakespeare and the Castle of the Amontillado. And we, she had Metallica playing and all kinds of other stuff that we probably shouldn't have been doing in the Catholic school, <laughs> but it really, helped to kind of prepare me for English and history mm. in high school and really kind of, it was a foundation. Shakespeare was a foundation for me. And I'm mm. really glad you brought that up because yeah, that's a great story. Yes. Um, yeah. I, I mean, that's really, really good that you got, that you managed to get stuff like that because that, uh, I mean, that's common place for like, you know, if you're in public school. Um, yeah. So, you know, a lot of people go to public school. They're like, ah, I know that I know all the Edgar Allan Poe's all, all, whatever, <laughs> but I'm like, one. yes, but that was my favorite part of going to public school is the Edgar Allan Poe, uh, like discussing all that reading, um, reading Frankenstein. Like I read Dracula on my own, not, not having been prompted by, uh, by the school. I was like, no, I'm, I'm the kid that wants the alternate version, uh, title, uh, uh of Dracula because I just love Dracula. So you actually read the original Dracula novel? I did. Yes. Really? Bram That's Bridge. incredible. Yes. yes. I read I it when I was maybe eighth grade, I want to say. I have yet to actually read that. It's very good. I've heard um, <laughs> He, I mean, <laughs> like, I was going to say spoiler warning, but I'm like, it's an old book. Yeah, um, spoiler warning for uh, however many <laughs> decades old book. Exactly. It's like, I think it's past that point. Um, but yes, I actually love uh, how, how Bram Stoker portrays Dracula um, because he's such a diva and I love it. Well, I mean, Strahd's kind of a diva too. Oh yeah, and that's the best that part. <laughs> that, that is my favorite. Like those type of iterations of vampires are, are my favorite type of iterations of vampire. And you can always gender swap straw too, which is something mm -hmm. we were talking about in our Saturday group in our off stream chat. We we're talking about how we can gender swap some vampire characters and how mm -hmm. straw. Yeah, that's that could be an obvious thing, um, but mm -hmm. neither of us have seen it done yet. Yeah, I mean, I'm just saying, Lady D is a thing. Just saying, yeah. that's an easy swap. <laughs> well, uh, we are also doing a Castle Dimitrescu one-shot set in D&D uh, &D 5e. So that's going to be 
very interesting. I think, to, which, <laughs> to which you can actually simp for Lady D because it's D and D five E, and it's set. I'm going to set it kind of like Renaissance era. Okay. Um, because there's. Uh, have you played through Village yet? Um, no, but I am watching it. I am watching it. Yeah. So there's a there's a, a sort of a pre Renaissance and restoration, uh, maybe restoration, depending. I'm not. I'm not. I wasn't an art major <laughs> in college, <laughs> but there looks to be mid 14th, 15th century uh, mm -hmm. paintings uh, throughout the castle, and one of them, which is in the main foyer when you first walk in, mm -hmm. is of the three sisters, and they're in that. Mm -hmm middle renaissance pre-victorian type of garb so you can set it back a few hundred years or even further right because you don't know how i mean you could even just wave your hand and say the legend goes back even further than that but that's exactly, exactly. what we're doing and we're going to have dnd 5e <laughs> characters in castle dimitrescu it's going to be a one shot the escape from castle dimitrescu and you can Bardic types can definitely try and use Lady D, to which we already have three people saying me. I was going to say, mm, Bardic types, because you know my cleric, not a bard, very much, yes. very much the horny lesbian type. <laughs> we love to see it. We love to see it. <laughs> and there's also, and back to the guide itself, there's also uh, with the seances. I wanted to talk about the setting yes. up for the seance and paying respect to the seances. And there's a whole preparation factor that is involved and there's the dms can really introduce their own flair like me i would add candles and smudging and incense and sage setting up grid zones you can really um go wild with this but there is a basic framework uh just for setting it up and getting it started and you can interact with one of several of the, of the entities in the house and some of the the messages that they send to you are terrifying like help under porch or you know things like that what are some other ones yeah she murdered me trapped cold that's the most terrifying one out of all of them and then she is coming get them out ha huh. five me below that's my kind of terror mm -hmm. which i love we also yeah for anyone that doesn't know um I play in a D&D campaign with D, and it is probably the most wonderful gayest campaign <laughs> that I have ever played in. It's, it's just, so very gay. Yes, which is just uh, all of the right beats. And even in my own campaigns that I run, there's just half of the half of the cast of characters and NPCs are LGBTQIA+. So mm -hmm. absolutely all inclusive D&D. We're here for it. We love to see it. Bring it on. Bring on more of it. Exactly. <laughs> And we have a, I'm trying to integrate more as well. And we even use the uh, combat chair in the Saturday game. We have oh. Hackenstone, who is the kind of inspired by Dagon. Of course. <laughs> even, though, even though Sam Regal could never get his name right. <laughs> <laughs> Dagon, Dagon. <laughs> Where's my uh, koi, koi pond? <laughs> <laughs> oh, critical role references. We love them. But just, and here's the little, here's the actual, the guide for a seance. What was your thought on the seances in general? I, I, I'm just like, oh my goodness, they're so <laughs> perfect. Um, well, I, I feel like uh, I definitely won't have as much insight as you do. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of what I know just kind of comes from Hollywood, <laughs> which is- Yeah, from, I mean that too. <laughs> yeah, um, but I, I thought they were very interesting and I, I thought you did bring up a very valid point of like, you know, uh, if you have a little bit more knowledge, um, it could definitely be one of those where you're involving your players. Um, I, I thought like, you know, the cool thing that I, I thought was uh, interesting that you brought up was, you know, actually having them smudge like that, I think would be really, really cool. That would be, something extra that you could throw in as a DM mm -hmm. that would just give it so many extra layers. And there's even a thing I just realized that this was, well, not realized, I remember that this was here, Beyond the yes. House for Further Adventures. And there are four, just there are just four examples of how to continue mm -hmm. into the mists. And there's Mordenshire, <clears throat> Morin Borka, I'm not really sure, Ferran Zalonin. Who is this? Oh, okay. I didn't even, and there's just so much more that we're, I'm just, this, is, this is the first <laughs> time I'm seeing this. This is really cool. There's so much going on here. Yeah, there's just, 
especially because you know there's since there's so much material it's like we were saying before like it's it's something that you could definitely take beyond level three and there's so much art here and you can use these in anything you can you can use a domain of dread in any campaign and so much on youtube has already been said about the domains of dread they're just these individual demi planes that exist within this realm of it's domains within the main domain of dread i'm not sure if it's a it's kind of a gray area i think whether it's an extension of the shadow fell or melds into the shadow fell but all of these different domains kind of within a larger domain i believe can all be interconnected in their own way it's this individual demi plane with all these other domains in it and you can traverse between the domains or you can just plug and play with the domains right what was your experience with the domains before <laughs> and rickton's did you have before all the YouTubers started releasing the pre-release <laughs> content, for me it was zero. Uh yeah, no, honestly, it was it was it was zero. Um, I, I hadn't necessarily had any experience with it. Um, I primarily really only had uh, experience with Forgotten Realms. Um, I had heard of you know things like Curse of Strahd, but I've never actually like looked into it. Um, but I knew that like you know uh, there there's other other worlds other than just you know what is in forgotten realm that much i didn't know here's falcovnia i have heard of this one before i think i've watched a couple of lore videos on youtube about falcovnia <laughs> but i remember this was one of the ones that i was interested in and it just such cool art and just looking at i'm one of those people that will look at a DD map and will say things like i want to go there i want to go there i want to go here <laughs> and like, yep. it just looks cool and i Actually, now that I think of it, I feel like most D&D players are like that. I feel like that's what draws us to D&D. Oh, yeah. No, it, like, just as an example, when, whenever uh, Panda brings up the uh, the map in the Sunday game, I'm like, well, yeah, but what's over here? Like, I don't, like, I know we need to go this way, but, like, what's over there? I want to see what's there. She gets so mad at us. <laughs> it's just like, I don't like, have that prepared. I'm it's like, like I'm, I'm sorry, it. then don't show me the map. Because I'm going exactly. to gonna want to Skyrim it. I'm going to want to go, like, the opposite way that you want me to go. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> that is, I think I tried doing that with my, if you remember, I tried doing that with my artificer. And she was like, no, we have to go here. <laughs> yeah, I did remember that. Like, I honestly, sometimes I kind of forget uh, in that in that game, it's like, you know, we have to go to the shrine. It's like, yeah, we gotta go to the shrine, but like, we don't know where it is, so why don't we explore and figure out where the rest of the stuff is? So this is a good segue as well to uh, sort of a session zero and to the Haunted Hero section, which has, is another reminder <laughs> of bringing in a session zero, which is obviously important you know, to let mm. your players know what to expect, but also safety tools. Uh, yes. And it's a good time to bring up safety tools, especially after a recent episode of Critical Role that we will not talk about, but that prompted okay. an entire video of safety tools, which actually really had upset me personally. Not obviously nothing. I'm not going to, you know, Critical Role didn't upset me. It was that incident itself was upsetting mm. to watch. Does that makes sense. Right. So yeah. it was and I think it was also legitimately triggering for a lot of people. Mm. Um, and just having really intense emotional events like that and and you know having things like harm to pets uh, child harm anything within that which all ties in it's important to do a session zero get consent do safety tools discuss what is and what is not okay for certain players especially with fears when you're bringing in people's deepest fears and phobias it's yep. really 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 important to go over safety tools and what people are comfortable with what they're not comfortable with mm. I know you have thoughts on that and I want to hear them. Oh yeah, no, I, I definitely 100% agree with, uh, you know, the things that they've been doing to kind of, you know, encourage that type of, um, you know, having that forethought of like, hey, you know what, um, uh, consent is really, really key in this, especially because uh, with D&D, &D, you know, uh, as you kind of said, uh, exploring things, especially things that have to deal with the horror genre, um, can be really triggering like i i myself i love horror um you know I, there are things that i will get into the nitty-gritty um but of course you know i have to also consider uh because it's not just me 
um, my character is playing the game. So like there may be things that trigger my character that like in, in the moment I might react to, which does not actually bother me or vice versa. Right. Something might um, trigger me as a player, but not necessarily my character because they're used to it or something like that. Um, and that should definitely be something that should always be, always be discussed at the table. Right. And there are consent sheets as well that you can print out now that are even more readily available than ever. So you can always find those anywhere online, probably. Oh, yeah. I, I've seen yeah. some some really, really nice ones. Um, and I think I think Panda actually uh, did give us some at the beginning yes. of, of our campaign, too. Our, our DM does have <clears throat> her own consent sheet and template, which is really nice to see. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about the lineages here for a second. Yes. So here is some more incredible art that other content creators have been putting on display. I love this art so much. Savra Sunstar confronting her father, the vampire Jander Sunstar. I don't know what domain that's <laughs> from or what story that's from, but it's just cool art. I'm going to be completely honest. No idea mm. where it's from. <laughs> I haven't completely read through every page of this book either. So, But Dom Piers, let's talk about vampires. <laughs> I we mean, who doesn't want to talk about vampires? <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't, I probably don't want to be friends with the person that does not. <laughs> that's where we, we have nothing in common, if that's the case. <laughs> it's like, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, you're just, you're not interesting, like vampires. <laughs> yes. Especially D&D &D vampires. Yes. Well, like, like vampires are a different story, but. I mean, you know, vampires, werewolves, like there's, there is a, I think I've said this to you, like in, in DMs, like there was a reason why Resident Evil uh, village hit me so hard. It was like, I mean, there's vampires and there's werewolves. You ain't got to say much else. I know nothing else about Resident Evil except for like the first couple of uh, first couple of games that it had zombies. I'm like, yeah, usually that 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 does the trick, but I'm like, this this one has stuff, An and I'm interested. Tall, sexy vampire, <laughs> exactly. This, yeah, that's the kind of content I want to see. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, Dampiers in in particular, I think honestly, of the three. Um, cause it was, yeah, it was three lineages. Um, mm -hmm. this one is probably hilariously the most tame, I think, yeah. compared to the other two. And like, I feel like there's not really a reason that, um, I can see a DM saying no, um, like no to these because they're really, you know, it's, it's super tame and it's a, it's a nice way for someone to become a vampire without having to go through the process of, uh, you know, being afflicted by uh by that particular uh infection i like these hungers blood flesh or raw meat uh cerebral spinal fluid csf which is really interesting i that's, found that interesting too because i was like how is that diff like that's so specific <laughs> it is very specific that's actually something that we used to check for when i worked as a paramedic we used to check for a csf on head injuries hmm. and if you if you take a piece of gauze and put it on blood that is draining from the, the ear canal, mm -hmm. if there is sort of a um, greasy white spot around the blood, mm -hmm. that's an indication of cerebral spinal fluid or CSF, which is it. interesting that it's one of the very specific things in here. Right. But considering the monsters that we're going to talk about later, it makes sense. It does make sense. Um, I, I think uh, we had also talked about, I, I do appreciate the dreams being on here. Uh, as Dampier, just because, uh, once again, the lore on vampires just in general is so deep and complex that there are actually zomb uh, zombies, vampires um, that do feast on dreams. And there's also the the psychic vampires too, the emotional vampires. Yes. What's the uh, what's the show that's like The Office but with vampires? Um, that everyone keeps talking about. Is it recent? It's relatively recent, like within the past couple of years. Okay, because I was like, the, the only, literally the only thing that came to mind when you said that was Buffy, because it like has that same sense of humor. But I was like, that's so not what you're talking oh, about. Oh no, it's like it's like filmed like The Office. Uh huh. And it's like I werewolves in Manhattan or New Jersey or something. Uh huh. And it follows around with like the the cameras, the lives, daily lives of vampires, mm -hmm. and they have one vampire. I can't remember his name. I've only seen a couple of episodes. His name is like Hank or something, and mm -hmm. all the vampires fear him and mm. he's an emotional vampire and they're like no no get away he's the only vampire <laughs> that's another vampires and everyone's like what was happening and they're all curious and it, it's just some dude and like a stained uh, polo and he opens uh -huh. the door and he's like hey 
Hey, you know, I really want to talk to you about the uh, the chore routines that we have going on here. <laughs> Last week was my week, and all the vampires are like, ah! <laughs> No, that sounds really funny, but I haven't heard of that show. Yeah, and he just talks about like the most mundane, like day-to-day -day activities, and he'll talk for like hours about them, about mm -hmm. some random television show, or about the list of chores they have to do, or about things like the types of paint <laughs> on the wall. Oh, it's, yeah, man. It's, it's really <laughs> funny. Uh, but going back to the uh, the Dampier here, there are some really cool origins. Mm -hmm. Parents are a vampire. The usual, you know, the usual things: surviving attack by a vampire, a parasite. So let's just okay. So for me, I like talking about the traits. That's the juicy stuff for me. I don't know oh yeah. <laughs> All right. So you are a humanoid, medium or small, thirty-five mm -hmm. feet of walk of uh, walking speed. Uh, the ancestral leg, the ancestral legacy, which allows you to, instead of taking the traits that are offered or the skill and ability increases that are offered by either the down pier, the hex blood, or the reborn. All three have the ancestral legacy, allowing you to take the skill proficiencies and other proficiencies that you would have had from whatever your base race is. So you pick a base race, as you normally would, yep. and then you can say, okay, do I want to take stuff from the half-elf? Do I want to take the proficiencies from the half-elf or the half-orc or the Goliath? What, whatever it is, you can choose to take those instead of the abilities, uh, of the abilities that they give you as far as mm. proficiencies are concerned from the Dampier, the Hexblood, and the Reborn, which is really cool. It gives you options. So you can right. weigh which one you like more and which is going to work best for the type of character that you want to play. Right. Dark you can Vision. Mix match. Uh, yeah, which is really cool that they give you the options because it's not a traditional race. It's just you you have become this thing. And right. That's why they give you the option of taking stuff from your base race that you had again whether mm -hmm. it's a half elf or vice versa humans even but who wants to play a human you have so many other options dark vision I mean, if you're min maxing that's the way to go like yeah min maxer <laughs> i mean don't tell anyone but i i actually do play i play one human you know my game <laughs> oh, i do play one humans but she is an oath of conquest paladin who is of the more evil alignments. So mm -hmm. even though she's a human, she's Knight of the Black Sun, Knight of Siric. She has mm -hmm. all of these, the Dark Pantheon. She follows Siric and Bashaba, and she's fit, she's fitting in great in Barovia. So she's actually playing yeah. in Barovia. So um, yeah, that, yeah, no, that sounds like something that uh, like for a human, <laughs> for a human, uh, she sounds very complex. Well, that's that's my way of making the human interesting. Was well, yes, I'm playing a human, but I'm breaking the archetype by making mm -hmm. her this out of control evil character that apparently Strahd is very curious about. But mm -hmm. we'll see how that plays out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> spider climb, vampiric bite. Here's your bite, your neck bite. Fang bite I is a natural weapon. Yeah, I think I, what I like about this one, just to kind of compare it to the the base um, vampire, is uh, this one doesn't specify that you have to have the creature um, incapacitated before you bite them, because uh, yeah. it does actually say that in in the uh, the base vampire or vampire spawn that the the creatures do have to be inca incapacitated before they bite. So it's cool. Okay, yeah, that is cool. It's based off your con modifier too, which is mm -hmm. interesting. And you regain hit points equal to the equal to the damage dealt by the bite, and you get a bonus to your next ability check or attack roll. Yeah, that's it's. This is it's super cool. Awesome. I think yeah. the bite the bite is like really really cool and it's handled well. And that kind of conjures images of the first Blade movie, to be honest, which is one of my favorite yeah. superhero movies. Still, I have references to Blade in our current homebrew campaign that I'm coming, mm -hmm. which is about, I, I, I took the hidden shrine of Tamao Chan, but I really played up the vampire part of it. And there's vampire mm -hmm. cultists and all kinds of crazy stuff going on. But it reminds me of the scene at the end of Blade where he has to, I mean, spoilers for a 20 year old movie now. <laughs> like spoilers for everything. <laughs> yes. But it reminds me of the scene at the end of Blade where, you know, he has to, feed on his girlfriend or on the love interest, right? He has mm -hmm. to actually bite her and drain her blood 
because mm -hmm. he's been intentionally drained as Deacon Frost is, is trying to keep him weak. And they're obviously going to use the blood of the Daywalker to empower the ceremony. Right. And after he escapes, he has this big kind of quasi erotic scene. That's a different story, right? About the, <laughs> that's, that's a whole different discussion. Right. So, but has a scene where he drains the blood and after he does, he lets out this bestial roar and you can see the strength and intensity return to him. His eyes are, you know, are on fire with this mm -hmm. hatred and he's basically supercharged. Yep. So that's exactly what this reminds me of is seeing Blade get supercharged from drinking the blood after he was drained a little bit. Mm, I agree. I agree. Hex bloods, which are mini hags, almost hags. Yep, almost hags, not quite hags. I think these are these are some of the more uh, interesting ones. These are like kind of the middle of the road because um, I think this one, not to jump ahead quite so much, but um, I think these ones actually do have an option to become a full hag at the end of it. Yes, I think I remember seeing that as well. Let's go through the other stuff. Yeah, first like a bullet point. So uh, obviously, Faye being Faye is kind of huge because you're not a humanoid. Mm -hmm. It's very powerful. Yeah. So anything that comes along with that, you know, defer to your DM or defer to whatever text you want to defer to. But when it really comes down to it, you can just be like, look, I'm a fae. Yeah. Not only, not only that, but like, if you really think about it, Hexblade is pretty much immune to uh, a lot of the hold spells because hold person, you, you're not a person, you're a fae. You're not a humanoid. Well, Hexblade is Fjord. Oh, sorry. Yes, Hex not Hexblade, Hexblood, Hex yes. Fjord. Fjord. <laughs> Ancestral Legacy again, of course. Uh, Dark Vision, 60 feet. Eerie. To okay, here it is. Okay, uh, would you like to please discuss for everyone the Eerie Token? <laughs> yeah, as a bonus action, uh, you harmlessly remove a lock of your hair, one of your nails, or one of your teeth. So, you know, definite body horror stuff going on there. Um, and the token is imbued with magic until you finish a long rest. Uh, while the token is imbued in this way, you can take any one of these actions. Um, so that's going to be telepathic mass, uh, message or the really cool part, which is remote viewing. So you could literally just take a lock of your hair, put it down somewhere and remotely view that, that particular area that you put it in. I mean, it's terrifying in the creepiest of ways. Oh, like, yes. Here, hold on. Let me just like grab a tooth and just hold <laughs> on to this tooth for me. Or you can plant a tooth on someone. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be, they don't have to be willing, right? I don't think I saw willing. No, I don't. Yeah, I think it was just like, honestly, if you can find a way to kind of like mm -hmm. just sneak it into their pocket mm -hmm. or something like that, you can basically just have a free way of like looking at someone. That's cool. Hex magic, you can cast Disguise Self and Hex just automatically. Here's some cool Hex blood art. I love this. Mm -hmm. Very Victorian Gothic. Okay, here it is. Becoming a hag. Okay, yeah. so... What are your thoughts on, on this is really cool. What, what are your thoughts on this? This is great. I love this. I think honestly, I'm glad that they put something in here um, because I feel like this is obviously with, with some particular uh, players, this is a natural progression to where they want to go. Um, Cause I know um, I actually do know a, a friend of mine has uh, what would be considered a hex blood um, because her mother was a hag. Uh, she obviously doesn't want to become a hag, but I can see this where, you know, players do want to explore that idea of, um, you know, it, it seeing that other side of, of their, um, of their heritage and going full force and turning into a hag. Yeah. And like you said, we all know stories about people who are already doing this anyway, which is I'm sure part of the inspiration for saying, let's just do a hex blood. Hags right. are cool. Everybody loves fake creatures. Exactly. I think Except the traveler... <laughs> I think the Traveler kind of helped increase the popularity of fake creatures. I know he did for me. Mm. Um, yeah, I would say uh, actually in one of my Saturday Saturday campaigns, um, there is a lot of things that we have going on with the Fae. So I'm I'm biased. I'm sorry, Davy. I don't agree. I think the Fae are amazing. <laughs> um, I think they're really cool. Um, I also think that they're assholes, but I think that's why they're they're really yeah. cool. <laughs> the they are for sure. And well, I mean, they have that whole trickster mentality, the whole trickster mm -hmm. god sort of base stat, I guess. I don't want to, that's not the right word to use, but by, de yeah, by default, there we go. By <laughs> default, they're 
just very, they fit the archetype of the trickster God. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of wiggle room there for your DM to really just go wild with whatever they want to do as far as right. really causing trouble <laughs> in your campaign. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. So my personal favorite of the new Gothic lineages is definitely the Reborn. Mm -hmm. And we created one in our Sunday <laughs> campaign. Because, oh man, <laughs> we didn't even mean to. <laughs> we are apparently <laughs> terrible people. Uh, there was, there, this was, yeah, the most recent session, I was kind of like, man, Eva really is hanging out with the wrong people for the, for certain things. Um, but I mean, realistically, you think about it, it was just really, a pun intended, a grave misunderstanding. It really was. There's your pun. <laughs> there's your pun for the night. And that, I don't even, I don't think you took that one from, da from Davy either, so there's, no excuse, Dean. <laughs> no, <laughs> no excuse. No, for that I, I love puns. If I if I was not playing um, my Elven cleric, uh, trust me, there would be more puns. She's entirely too refined for puns. We made a Frankenstein monster in our <laughs> because my barbarian was a little bit too hasty. I mean, yeah, again, couldn't really uh, couldn't really blame her. The, the uniform was of a slaver uh, group that we had come across. Um, I, the only thing I can really say is thank, thank um, multiple gods that I had the foresight to cast Gentle Repose yes. um, on them and pause the timer of, of death and also had the Mending Cantrip. And the diamond. Um, and <laughs> the diamond was necessary the minute I got revivified. So that yes. was always going to be a thing. But the multiple steps to getting to here, to where we were of like casting gentle repose, having me uh, mending, um, and having not only you, but also Seraph and our bard there to kind of like, you know, make yeah, sure that this went well. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I, it should have been a red flag to me when I walked up to the guy and said, hey, do you remember me? And he said, no. No, no idea. Very <laughs> happily. He was charmed. But to to be fair in that regard, um, I was very much being an enabler <laughs> that entire yeah. round. Um, that like that entire session. I was just like, no, 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 do it, because it'll be funny. He doesn't even remember you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my Barb was not having it. But our DM used the reborn from Van Richten's to mm -hmm. that was a perfect segue for us to talk about the reborn origins. And there's a bunch of different things there because we had to, again, basically Frankenstein this Githyanki's head back onto his body with the combined efforts of the barbarian who's somehow proficient in medicine, <laughs> the, cleric, <laughs> the cleric and the bard all working together to Frankenstein this person yeah. back to life. And then of course the diamond and everything like that. But you could use any combination of these origins for that. And it doesn't have to be one specific origin. You can use any of these eight or your own spin on any of them. Right. which are really cool. And there's even some reborn examples for the Domains of Dread specifically, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. Okay, so traits. You're not technically undead. I think a lot of people were thinking it might be undead. Right. Remember small, 30 feet, uh, ancestral legacy. Of course, deathless nature. Here it is. It's all kind of collected into one little bullet point. And uh, these are just so good. Advantage on saving throws against disease or being poisoned. Resistance to poison, yep. advantage on death saving throws. Yep. You don't need to eat, drink, or breathe. Nor do you need to sleep, and magic can't put you to sleep. Yeah, elves eat your heart out. <laughs> yeah. Like, jeez. Oh man, it's like the the reborn are just like mechanically. It feels like the Yuan-Ti and some elves got together, and had a kid, and this is what they created. Because oh man, this is nutty. So what's your favorite out of the three, officially, after we just went mm. over the Honestly, like, I'm still kind of partial to, to the Dampir. Um, like I said, it, it, it's it's really just because, you know, vampires. Um, I also think Hexbloods are really, really cool. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of between those two, but if I really had to pick one, Dampir all the way. Yeah. We had a Dampir that I was playing around with in one of our homebrew campaigns. And it was kind of fun to play. I did a Tampere Blood Hunter just to be basic, but 
Now, the dark gifts, these are cool. I'm just going to kind of go over what they are. They're just gifts that the dark lords of the domains of dread can bargain with you to receive. And there's a long list of them. We didn't even have the time. We didn't even have the, the chance or the time to go over these, but they're all here. These are all things that your DM can integrate into your campaigns that just give you all kinds of different benefits. Like for like, let me bring up second skin just as one that we can look at, for example, for an example, if it decides to actually load. There we go. All right. This is another side of you that most people have never seen. When you show this side of yourself, you might become another person entirely. Roll, or, uh, roll on or choose an option from the second form table to determine this other side of yourself. So there is a right, hybrid form of humanoid and beasts, an exaggerated version of your own form, an angelic, demonic, or a barren form, a vaguely human-shaped creature made of slime, fey-like shape. Uh, and that obviously mechanically allows you to cast Ultra Self. Okay. which is pretty cool. And there's a change... Oh, this is really cool. A change catalyst? See, we didn't even go over this last time. This is awesome. Mm -hmm. Seeing a particular phase of the moon, smell of a certain flower, the sound of ringing temple bells, if you're Daenerys Targaryen. <laughs> Here. Here. Oh, boy. R.I.P. Season 8. Hearing a particular melody, touching pure silver with your bare skin. This is really cool. Seeing someone resembling a specific individual. I like, I like all of these. Yeah, these are really cool. And again, this is the first time we're seeing these. Backgrounds, they officially added Haunted One. I think everyone's familiar with the Haunted One at this point. Yep. Investigator, very similar to City Watch Investigator, except with ghosts. And there's some fantastic art here. I love the Victorian, the Gothic Victorian. And she's holding one of the severed hands. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did, I did remember seeing this one. And you can choose different cases and... It gives you two proficiencies, uh, insight, investigation, or perception. Disguise get thieves tools and a magnifying glass and evidence from a past case. The common closed and 10 gold. Um, let's talk about subclasses. Yes, let's. All right, do you want to take the lead on the College of Spirits or the Undead Warlock? Uh, I, can do, I can do Undead since I know that you like the, the College of Spirits a lot. Okay. Let's talk about the Undead Warlock. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, cool art again. Oh yes, like this. I I love his little pet that's like just kind of hanging on on his uh, on his arm there. Um, but yeah, like this this is probably one of the one of the more interesting um, warlocks that I've ever seen. Um, and I'll I'll just say now, like I, I remember t when we were talking about this, I was saying that this is probably one of the warlocks that if I made another warlock, I would take this all the way through. I would not multi-class like in any any capacity. Not even just a le one level dip. I would just go all the way through. Um, just because I mean like well for one, just to start with the, the, the spells that they get um, on top of everything else. Um, uh, you know, Bane I'm always a fan of Bane. I know people prefer Bless, but I love Bane. Um, False Life is really, really good, especially if you are trying to build uh, a warlock that is more frontline-y, because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, temporary hit points, everybody loves those. Blindness, Deafness is another one of those spells that I feel like is super underrated, because, um, I mean, it's basically just a single target fairy fire, or at least that's how I treat it. If you can um, pull it off. It's yeah, spell. yeah, exactly. Um, and especially on a warlock, um, Super, super good because it. I, I think it's very easy for you to get your DCs high enough to to the point where you can almost always guarantee it going on. Pump into that charisma. <laughs> exactly. Um, Phantasmal Force, really, really good. I love Phantasmal Force. Mm. Um, it is. It is something that has a lot of versatility, and it's not just for damage. Um, I mean, if I can get my one critical roll. Um, uh, just uh, you know, blurb about it. We're both uh, Sam Regal. <laughs> Sam Regal has used Phantasmal Force uh, a multitude of times with his character, um, and I thought each and every one of his uses were just absolutely super creative and really innovative. Because I wouldn't have thought of something like that. Me neither. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, and then, of course, you know, you have Phantom Steve, Speak with Dead, mm -hmm. uh, Death Word, Great Invisibility, Anti Life Show, uh, and uh, Cloud Kill. Kill. Cloud kill, that. super good. Um, super powerful. Mm -hmm. 
but uh, to get to the to the first feature of the undead uh, the form of dread, love form it. of dread is insane. Um, I think this is probably one of the best things if you're trying to build a frontline warlock. Um, because I see it coming into play a little bit more as a frontline, or you getting more use out of it. But I mean, you know, pick I. There's plenty of times where you could build a backline warlock and something decides, well, you know, I'm going to walk past your front line and, and try and get to you. Now you're a little bit uh, more of a, of a tanky wizard. You can take a hit. Um, so you do get temporary hit points equal to uh, a D10 plus your uh, warlock level. Um, plus, once during each of your turns, you when you hit a creature with an attack, you can force it to make a wisdom save or be frightened. I love fear. Love like, fear. That is debilitating. And you're immune um, to it. Yeah, and you yourself are immune to frightening. So it's just like, ah, I can frighten you, but you cannot frighten me. It's like, that's first level, that's really strong. And there's really uh, an opportunity for the DM to really allow you to really transform into what you want, which I think is the next mm -hmm. part of that. Yes. Um, so yeah, uh, that that is the part that uh, Aaron was talking about with the appearance of your form dread reflects some aspects of your patron. Um, so you... you Basically, go wild with this. Uh, if you want bat wings because your patron is Strahd, get them bat wings. Yeah. Do it. Do it. Um, you can have bat wings. Vampire wings. Anything. Bat. Um, so, just to kind of look at some of the other ones, uh, Grave Touched. Um, you basically you don't need to eat, breathe, or, or uh, six drink level. anymore. Okay, there we go. Okay. At six level, you you no longer have to do any of that any of that silly stuff. Um, you still need to sleep. Um, unless I believe you take the invocation for Warlock, so then you can become somebody who basically just doesn't have to do any of this stuff. Long rest, what are those? <laughs> um, uh, and then additionally, to kind of get uh, another part of this feature for, for six level is um, you, you also replace the damage type with whatever you're doing to necrotic damage. Uh, so if, you can do that once on so like yeah. bludgeoning piercing, you can just be like, nope, necrotic. Exactly, exactly. Um, so, uh, and I think, uh, oh, yeah. And then while you're using your form of dread, you can roll one additional damage die uh, when determining necrotic damage that the target takes. So it's, it's basically just, you know, you want to do damage? Do you want to do damage? You're going to do damage. <laughs> Um, and then moving on to the 10th level ability, your connection with undeath and necrotic energy now this saturates is my favorite your body. Um, so you much. have resistance to necrotic damage. There you go. But if you're transformed uh, into your form of dread, that you instead become immune to necrotic damage. So, you know, zombies... Don't know, don't know nothing about that. Uh, vampires... so you're flying around the battlefield with your vampire bat wings out, mm -hmm. casting necrotic damage, being immune to fear, causing fear, and channeling necrotic mm -hmm. damage, channeling things to just decay and wither. Exactly. It's really freaking cool. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it, it's, it's basically just, it gets really, really good at 10th level. Um, and then in addition to that, when you are reduced to zero hit points, you can use your reaction to instead drop to one hit point um, and cause your body to erupt with deathly energy. You just kind of go boom. Corpse explosion. It's the <laughs> exactly. Corpse explosion. Exactly. Um, and then it, it's a it's a pretty respectable damage um, because it is uh, each creature of your choice. So like if you're standing in the middle of a bunch of allies, you don't have to harm them. Um, Which is so it really is interesting. I know, right? Yeah. Um, targeted corpse explosion. Targeted. Uh, within 30 feet. Um, and like I said, respectable damage of 2d10 plus your warlock level. Um, now, the one key thing is uh, it's really good, but you do gain a level of exhaustion for doing it, which, I mean, makes sense. You're basically making your body explode yeah. with necrotic energy. I'm going to spew necrotic, direct, necrotic <laughs> energy in this direction in particular, avoiding my allies. Exactly, exactly. Um, uh, and then, of course, it, it, does, uh, it doesn't come back until 1d4 long rest, which is interesting, um, because normal normally yeah. abilities like that are just, you know, per On long, long rest. rest. Yeah, this one is a d4. Um, and then the, the good part, the reason why I say you really, really don't want to multi-class is, is this part, the spirit projection. Um, your, your spirit can become untethered from your physical form. And as an action, you pro, uh, project your spirit from your body. 
This body you leave behind is unconscious in a state of suspended animation. Your spirit resembles your mortal form uh, almost in, in almost every way, replicating your game statistics, but not your possessions. Uh, any damage or other effects that apply to your spirit or physical body, uh, oh, wait, I think I skipped that, uh, that apply to your spirit or physical body affects the other. So, you know, there, it, it, you do still suffer some. Yeah, that's the only thing, though, is that you share damage. I don't, that's the yeah. one part that would make me go, ah, uh, you know. Yeah. Um, but it gets better. <laughs> um, so, uh, your spirit can remain outside your body for up to an hour or until your concentration is broken, as if you're concentrating on a spell. Mm -hmm. um, when the projection ends, your spirit returns to your body um, or your body magically teleports to your spirit space, your choice. Um, so while you are projecting, you gain the following benefits. Your uh, your spirit and body gain resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage. That's the upside. Yep, that's the upside. So even though you're sharing the damage, um, you know, so long as it is bludgeoning, piercing, slashing damage, uh, magical or not, because that's the other key thing is it doesn't specify if it has to be magical, which some abilities at this level typically do. Mm -hmm. um, so no matter what it is, so long as it is that, that type, uh, you get resistance to it. Um, in addition to that, uh, when you cast a spell of the conjuration or neck or uh, necro uh, bleh, goodness, I can't speak. Necromancy. When you cast a spell uh, of conjuration or necromancy schools, uh, the spell doesn't require any verbal or semantic or material components that lack yeah. gold costs. So you can just so, wave your hands around and go nuts and just exactly speak tongues, and you'll be casting all kinds of spells, which is fantastic. If you have so a DM think, that really brings that into play, so Some I think what's interesting. Cards. Um, not not to cut you off, but like what's interesting about the undead is I feel like it really fixes the problem of I feel at least from what I've heard from some some of my friends that play warlocks is they don't like just casting Eldritch Blast. They don't like the limitation of just having that. It's like, well, I mean, you know, now you don't even have to worry about things like, you know, having material components for your stuff. You can do your cool non eldritch blast spells and just go yeah i guess got fireball just because i can just because i can for I no other it, reason that i can <laughs> i think i think people like saying eldritch blast but it does get kind of stale because of travis the eldritch blast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean i can definitely understand like it does get uh does get old which is why i understand when people uh do uh you know multi-class out of warlock mm -hmm. I, I get it um but this is one where, I, where i'm like yeah i feel like you should stick with it uh for the long haul um and that's not even like well that is half of it because that's you know the second bullet point of four but there's other stuff to it um not only that but you also gain a flying speed mm -hmm. uh, equal to your walking speed if you don't have one already because at, at 14th level it's possible that you your dm yeah. gave you yeah. some magic items that do give you a uh, flying speed mm -hmm. um but uh, what those magical items can't do for you is allow you to go through creatures and objects. This actually does let you do that. Uh, so you effectively become a ghost. Um, and in the same way that you become a ghost, uh, you can't really stop in an area that uh, that is occupied or stop in a wall because uh, you will take a, D force of, uh, a D10 of force damage um, if you do end your turn in that. Um, like I said, very much like a ghost. Um, so yeah, do, do you yeah. want to say something real quick? No, no, that, that, that was great. That was fantastic. This is, it's really cool. I've never played a warlock, but if I was to play one, this is definitely one of the options I would consider. Again, I don't really know too much about the warlock because I've never mm -hmm. played one, mm -hmm. but this is pretty cool. I like this. It's it so is. you're just basically flying around again, whether it's with your wings out or not in a spectral form. And you're just mm -hmm. this terrifying specter on the battlefield, just it's just really, really cool to imagine yourself doing this stuff mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and to describe it to the other players. Exactly. Um, and then uh, the one last thing that you do get from your from your form of dread while you're using it once during each of your turns when you deal necrotic damage, which I mean at this point should pretty much be all the time because you do get the ability to change mm -hmm. uh, any type of damage into necrotic, you do regain hit points equal to half the amount of necrotic damage dealt. Like, Which is really cool. So you're this, just you're also healing. Yes. So you're healing yourself. Like I said, this makes for a really, really powerful frontline warlock. I'm not saying that you have to do that, um, but if I were to build a warlock, I would build an undead um, pact of the blade warlock. That's that's the route that I would go. 
That would be really cool because then you have your necrotic damage coming out of your weapon. Mm -hmm. And when you're flying around, whether it's with your your wings or whether it's in your spirit projection form, you're just Mm -hmm. this blade-wielding vampire hybrid shadowy force of terrifying yep whatever adjective you want to use to describe it it's just (laughs) really you're just adding on cool factor after cool factor it's just metal af it's really cool yeah i i like i said i think this is like one of the cooler uh warlocks not that i don't like my hex blades because i do you know they're really good. Uh, I, I can't lie. I built a sword lock um, and I built a power lock. So mm-hmm. I, I get it. I get why hex blades are so strong, but this is a really strong contender for, for that, I think. For sure. And I'm very excited about potentially, I'll probably make a test character like I always mm-hmm. do. Of course. So I'm very excited to like take it for a spin, if you will, kind of see like do the, you know, fly around and see how it plays mm-hmm. as like an NPC or something like that. So yeah, yeah, that I'm excited for because I, I am that person that does that. And every time I do, <laughs> every, every time I do something comes out, I'm like, oh, let's make a DMP, let's make a, an NPC that I can put in there that actually has a character sheet that mm-hmm. I can mess around with and right, you know, just try it out. And yeah, no, it, I agree. So uh, we're running a little bit short on time. So I'm just going to breeze through the College of Spirits real quick. It's basically, obviously, tarot cards. I love tarot cards. I read tarot cards. Guiding Whispers at level three. Three. <laughs> you learn the Guidance Cantrip, which is cool. I love Guidance. We have a cleric in our Monday group who is just shouting Guidance every five seconds. It's a free love T4. It. Like, come yeah. on. <laughs> yep. Employee Tools, Aid Channeling Spirits. Starting at six level. When you cast a bar's bill that deals damage or restores hip- So this is the one that has a controversy behind it. Yes. Do you want to just go over the controversy real quick as to what your th- thoughts Yeah, were yeah, on yeah. It? So basically the controversy comes from uh since uh in in D and specifically um using material components, um, you know, you have uh, the ability to do it for flavor, but typically when you're using something that has material components, you, you can use a focus um, instead of having to, you know, have a component bag, which is, you know, normally what, what oh, you would expect a wizard to have. Um, but when you do use the focus, um, this is actually one of the ones that replaces it where you can use, I think it was like a skull, a uh, crystal ball or, or, or tarot cards or some, some, something to that effect. But basically it allows you to add a D6 um, in, in addition to healing or damage rolls. Now damage rolls is fine because there, there are some uh, that do have material components uh, as a part of that spell. Uh, I believe shatter is one of them. Um, or no, I'm sorry, Cloud of Daggers is what I'm thinking of. So Cloud of Daggers actually would be one of the spells that is applicable for this. Uh, but the healing spells is where that controversy comes in because a lot of yeah. those healing spells that the Bard has access to that also requires material and components is typically spells like Raise Dead, Resurrection, Revify. Those don't really restore hit points. Or rather they do, but it restores you to one HP, which is like almost negligible because you're getting one HP plus a D6, which is like, okay, why? (laughs) So it's really up to a DM how your DM wants to interpret this. I feel like there's going to be a lot of DMs interpreting it as we talked about over the weekend. Like this is just really the DMs can make whatever house ruling on they want. I think we're going to see a lot of house rules on this uh, for those that do want to play the College of Spirits in particular, probably Mm -hmm. in session zero, sitting with their DM and being like, hey, can we talk about the the spirit yeah. focus and just you know how do you want to use it i think where the bard really shines and yes you're absolutely correct so it's using the the tarot cards as a focus which is exactly what she's doing here in this art this fabulous mm-hmm. art and the tales from beyond this is your again uh, the best feature of this bard and it just lets you roll on the tales from beyond table which is my favorite thing and it's as you said the bardiest of bards <laughs> which was my favorite quote from from you when we were talking over the weekends. And there are all these different tales and stories that you are sort of whispered, uh, whispers on the wind that you can interpret and retell tales from tales from beyond. (laughs) And there's just so much going on here with, and there is a, again, a random factor to it, Mm -hmm. but uh, you can basically, the first one gives you luck points essentially 
And most of these use your Bardic Inspiration die or your modifier. Mm -hmm. A target takes force damage equal to your Bardic Inspiration die plus your Christmas modifier. Target gains temporary hit points. Tale of a, of a Runaway. This was an interesting. Oh, yeah, you can move up to 30 feet as a reaction. Yep. Extra damage as equal to your Bardic Inspiration die. Yeah, these are all just really, really nice. There's, a, there's so many more here, too, that are really cool. Become invisible, uh, deal psychic damage, deal yeah. thunder damage, fire damage. Yeah, so a lot of it's just, I mean, when it really comes down to it mechanically, it's pretty standard stuff, but it's really cool how it ties into these different tales and really also allows the the bard or the player to really just, in the process, if they're really over the top and extra like I am, I can just, <laughs> I can improv these tales on the spot. And there can even be like different, different tales or you can tell two or three different tales of the mind bender if that's your thing if you're really interested in improv and making up stories on the spot which is mm -hmm. a weird thing that some people are into like myself <laughs> <laughs> so this is definitely the kind of bard that i would want to play spirit session you know communing with the spirits and uh, mystical connection at 14th level you can roll the dice twice whenever you roll spirit tales so it's not that great, but when you get to level 14, it's just if you don't like the spirit tail that you get on that D12 table, you can roll again. Again, is it worth getting to level 14? I don't know. I'm sure a lot of people are going to say no. I think it's pretty cool. I might multi-class myself if I was doing that. I don't know mm. if it's necessarily worth it. But that's uh, basically it for the two main new subclasses, College of Spirits and the Undead. I think they're both really cool. Anything else you want to say about the College of Spirits? Uh, no, I mean, like, I can't, I, I feel like that quote kind of encompassed my feelings of, uh, of this particularly new bar, uh, new bard, uh, is the bardiest bard that I've ever seen. Uh, cause I mean, it is that, that table just kind of has so many different applications and it's so versatile that it's like, yeah, I mean, you really could have an answer for anything. There's also a new horror trinkets table, which is really nice. A little black book that records your dreams and yours alone when you sleep. These are great. There's there's a <laughs> hundred in here, and there's literally a table for everything, which I absolutely love. Creating your own domain of dread, genres of horror. There's different body horror, cosmic horror, dark mm -hmm. fantasy. There's all these DM tips and tricks for all of these, the pre-existing domains of Ravenloft. So all of those maps we looked at before, they're all here, and you have your all of there's a whole huge section in here with all, that's a fantastic piece of art. We didn't see that last time. Yeah, no, that's gorgeous. And there is, wow, I, I want to play in Calicari. <laughs> wow, okay. Yeah, see, we just clicked on a random one and I was immediately like, wow, I want to, I want to play there. Uh, Morden is the map. Looks pretty close to Barovia. And, okay, well, all right, ghosts. The Lachen, probably saying that wrong. But there's all kinds of cool little art in here and everything, too. This is great. I love it. Yeah, these are all really, really cool. Travelers in the Mists, uh, Mist Wanderers. There is a whole table for, I think, six different NPCs that you can use in mm -hmm. any of the domains of Dread. And more cool art. There's just so much the Taroka deck, horror toolkit, curses. <laughs> so you can mess with your players and you can, there's all kinds of different curses, tips on creating your own curses, haunted traps. Uh, and there's even a survivor table. Mm -hmm. Real quick, let's just go over. I just want to show some of the art here. This is, this is the bag hag. <laughs> All right. Um, if you could pick, okay, pick three monsters that you want to talk about that you want to just look at. Uh, I want to say, well, obviously the Nosferatu. Um, I don't want to take it from you because I feel like you want to talk about the zombie clot. Um, but uh, no, let's talk about the let's talk about the zombie clot. Wait, real quick, here's, <laughs> here's the Nosferatu. Yeah, so I, I really like this guy. He's really really cool. Um, also, really really nasty. Uh, cause his special ability is he just vomits bloods on, on your, uh, your players. Yes. And yeah. 
yeah, the imagery for that sounds terrifying. Vicious Undead Hunters, Regeneration, Spider Climb, and then they can... So I think what we talked about was they can climb on the ceiling and then vomit damaging blood on you. Yep. Where's like, the zombie pot? Uh, there it is. Yeah. These things are awful. <laughs> Man, they are awful. Um, it, it just basically, uh, you know, if you get caught by this thing, you better hope that you have a barbarian or somebody that has strength um, and they roll high because getting out of this thing once you're in it is just awful. <laughs> I mean that's why that's why it's a zombie cloud. It's just you can yeah. start with a couple of zombies and then it just spirals out of control. Yep, 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 yep. And like you just you can even see the dude in in the in the art. <laughs> like he he knows what's going on. He doesn't want any part of that. Yeah, he doesn't want to fight this thing. He is ready to run. I love this so much. And Todd Kendrick actually, I think this was his favorite when he was talking when he was doing his own mini series mm -hmm. on Ben Richtens. Mm -hmm. What else do you want to talk um, about? There's so much cool stuff here. The Nosferatu was really cool. Yeah. Um, I think, what was, wasn't there one like a sturgeon or like a humanoid stor sturgeon? Sturge, mm, I think. Yeah. Humanoid sturge. There, there we go. Stur, stur, I don't know how to pronounce that. Stur, I'm Stroy? not even going to try. I don't know. <laughs> Strigoi. Yeah, Strigoi. Uh, but yeah, I, I really like these guys because like they look really, really cool. Mm -hmm. um, and they can also summon like tiny sturges. So, yeah. Small yeah. Yeah, like you want you want blood suckers. These are blood suckers. These plus, um, you know, the ability to summon one d four plus two surges. Oh, that's right. They can they can suck your insides out. Mm hmm. So if you what was this? I think this one was like a uh, if you reach zero with these guys, yeah, you uh, they you you die because they suck all of your insides out, and all that's left <laughs> is just your skin and whatever you were wearing. That's yep. it. Yep. Just that's it. Just skin. It's pretty savage. Yep. It's horrifying. <laughs> Necrocore. What was was this one of the one? Oh yeah, this was the, the Oh, this was the the, the Lich yeah. one. Yeah, it's sort of like a necromancer in a jar. Mm hmm There's the body taker plant, which I mean it speaks for itself, but the art is cool. Right. You don't you definitely don't want to get sucked into that. That is no, that is no. a nobody now. Uh so the cool thing about the body taker plant though is that it is that if you do get sucked into the body taker plant, your companions have an hour to get you out. Yes, so it's not immediate death, but yeah. um, if, if they don't find you within that hour, that character's gone. <laughs> I just want to show everyone how beautiful this art is. This is yes. shiny. <laughs> he just wants the shiny. Yeah. That's all he's here for. Like, uh, yeah, I wouldn't mind being uh, infected by were-raven lycanthropy. I mean, so, you get cool wings. Yes. This thing is terrifying. The Gallo speaker. Yeah. I hate this one. Yeah, this one was. The, oh, yeah, because this one had the face. The faces in the uh, in mm -hmm. the clothes. The wailing yeah. soul that it's made of. Mm hmm. Terrifying, truly. Whoever whoever made these, props to them, because yeah, just these are these are terrifying. And yeah, this if you if you have a good DM who can really compound on the horror effects, this is just gonna scare the absolute living whatever out of your players yeah i will Gallus. say the, the one thing that we did notice too is there's a lot of creatures that when you drop to zero you die with these creatures so there mm -hmm. is a lot of that in here which i mean i guess also leads to the the horror aspect the unspeakable horror which is one of my favorites <laughs> because it can it can uh squeeze itself into a one inch space and let me look at this thing this thing all of this can squeeze into a one inch space and just plow through. Yes. <laughs> exactly. That is terrifying. And it has four different hexes. All kinds of, there's roll tables for limbs, types of hexes, types of bodies. Mm -hmm. I think this is one of the ones that can drop you. Um, yeah, Maybe I think not. so. Uh, let's see. Hex Blast. Oh no, it's just 7d12 necrotic damage. Yeah, you know, just, it's not gonna drop you, or at least it's not gonna kill you at zero, but it will hurt. Yes. Petrify, yeah, so this, this can do a lot of really unfriendly things to you, but <laughs> I just love the way that it, I mean, look at, look at this thing, it's just absolutely terrifying. 
Yeah, it is unspeakable truly unspeakable. <laughs> there is the Delahan, which is, oh, that's right, that's not the one that uh, that loads. And I think one of your favorites that we have to talk about, the yes. Lugaru. Look at this Good boy. boy. <laughs> yes, the bestest boy. Uh, werewolf lycanthropy, please. I think he's got a little chicken claw over here on his part. <laughs> one of his braids. That's great. This thing deals a lot of damage. and, and Oh, yeah. This it, thing hurts. It's mostly raw damage, but it infects you with werewolf lycanthropy, which, again, I think, you know, given the times, a lot of us are like, eh. <laughs> yeah, it's just not so bad. Yeah. Best boy. And then, of course, my personal favorite. Ah, yes. This horrific amalgamation of teeth and claws and tentacles and everything else. Just, yeah, everything. And you can see the different animals and the fur and the teeth and the tentacles. There is a boar, a rabbit, a Venus flytrap. A toothy a mall somewhere yeah. in the background. And the way that they put the art, they actually left some of the text up here in roll uh, yeah, on roll 20. But it's actually kind of funny. If you understand the full hungry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <Sure. laughs> That is that is my favorite quote from this, <laughs> which is again obviously a typo or just a, a misprint as far as where it is. Or mm. if you understand the full, yeah, if you understand the full hungry hostility, but by itself, that's going to be like my new moniker. I'm, I'm going to say that <laughs> in one of the other games when they encounter an eldritch horror or something. If you understand the full hungry, it's just like the the feel the, the full hungry. <laughs> so yeah, it's the full hungry. And then there's the hopping vampires. There's all kinds of cool stuff here. I, I really and, appreciated the the hopping vamp uh, the hopping vampire because it's not very yes. often that you see, um, you know, other other iterations of of those types of vampires. Yes, and we figured out that this was uh, Chinese culture, right? Yes, uh, Jiangxi. Yeah. Yeah. Is it the Chinese hopping vampire? I mean, it's also terrifying. Oh yeah. <laughs> like in case you weren't horrified enough by the previous things, there you go. It's afraid of its own reflection, though, so it's bringing in actual folklore, which is great. Mm -hmm. Acceptable. The holy symbols and the consume energy is... It, it can turn you into a white and then turn you into a Jiangxi if you're not cured. Yeah. So it can be pretty... It can get pretty dangerous pretty quickly, especially mm -hmm. if you're really attached to a character. Yes. So that is definitely a problem. The Relentless Juggernaut is just a big beefy boy that swings around a weapon that can kill you almost he's, instantly. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, look he, at he's it. Elf, he's Elf of Blood. Yeah. I mean, that's cool art, too. This is incredible art. This is art I want to use. Mm -hmm. Relentless Juggernaut. And then the Ravenhelm. Uh, just that's Chef's Kiss art right there. Oh, yeah. Gosh. And then this. I want us to look at the Star Spawn ability real quick because I know there was one. It makes everything in sort of a certain range, difficult terrain. Yeah, 10d10 acid damage, and it's a 30-foot radius of a toothy maw. And, yep. the, and the save mm -hmm. is DC 23. So within 30 feet, there is just gnawing, gnashing, unspeakable body horror that is just tearing, trying to tear you apart. And it's difficult terrain. And every time you do anything in that area, you take 10d10 acid damage on a fail yep. save yep um the other the other thing about this thing is it also um i think it also summons in uh oh gosh what are they called the uh oh yeah the battling mouthers the gibbering yeah. mouthers gibbering mouthers there we go yep. um yeah those like that combined with this it's just thankfully this thing is so high cr that like it makes sense for it to be as difficult as it is but mm -hmm. man that is brutal psychic orb lashing maw <laughs> and warp space which it can just distort the actual space around you which is terrifying yeah. in its own way cosmic horror haslin monsters of ravenloft oh, this book has literally everything i think I still stand by, and this is cool art too, I still stand mm -hmm. by from what I said about a 10 out of 10. This is just an incredible, incredible book. I bought it on as soon as I could <laughs> on Roll20, and I actually i am going to buy a physical copy again. This is just an absolutely incredible, incredible source book. 
absolutely recommend it. Oh yeah, I, I wholeheartedly agree. Um, I mean, I'll I'll say what I said when we were reviewing it the uh, over the weekend. Uh, I would wholeheartedly, um, the minute I get a chance, I would wholeheartedly buy the alternate uh, version uh, of this it's and just put hard. it up on my put it up on my shelf, just because I I think it's it's worth it. And there's so much good stuff in here. Yeah, and thank you so much, Steve, for bearing with us as yeah. we kind of went a little over. So thank you. And uh, I think uh, any final thoughts? I mean, 10 out of 10, you seem to think the same thing, which is awesome. We're on the same page. Love it. Yeah, I mean, like I said, uh, this kind of hits all those notes of, you know, I'm a fan of horror. I'm a fan of everything that's vampire, uh, uh, you know, cosmic horror, werewolves. So, like, it, it checks all the boxes for me. Totally. Do you have anything you want to plug for yourself as far as self promo? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, you guys can follow me on Instagram if you feel so inclined. Um, it is Afro Puff Lady. Um, and uh, I don't quite have it up yet. Uh, I think I said so at the beginning, but I'm uh, just now getting word of my graphics card coming in. So soon I shall start streaming. Nice. And for us, it's just twitch.tv slash girl. We stream a D&D campaign every other Saturday. And yes, go follow D on Instagram. And we'll look forward to hearing what announcements that she has as far as getting uh, that PC fix. It'll be interesting. Yeah. Interested yeah. in seeing what D&D shenanigans come out of it. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so, all right. So thank you, everyone. Uh, that's it for us. Have a wonderful wonderful rest of may or into june depending on when i'm able to actually get this published <laughs> and uh, i don't know when the next source book is coming out but uh, you'll know <laughs> yeah you'll know because we're gonna do a video on it exactly all right well have a good night everyone right, we'll see you next time have a good one all right and uh steve we're good to go